He's not there. Charge up. Let him come. अभी हो गया स्ट्रीम Okay, Bimal. So, are we uh, ready? Yeah, just give me one minute. Yeah. Yeah, I think Ravi, we can start. Okay. Thanks, uh, friends. Uh, on behalf of Center for the Study of Open Societies, I welcome you all uh, to this. Uh, lecture series which is part of our uh, azadi ka amrit mahotsav and uh, i am really pleased uh, uh, to see uh, uh, although from a distance we expected and hoped uh, that uh, dr bimol akajam uh, who's been a, a colleague uh, and uh, some of us were hoping actually to see him here uh, live but that could not be he had certain compulsions and he'll be uh, speaking from uh, home uh, in the same city. Uh, but uh, uh, welcome you all to this uh, uh, virtual session then. Uh, and uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Angomcha Bimal Akayam. Uh, he is a graduate from Pune University. He did his MA and PhD from University of Delhi. That's when we met also in the late 80s and early 90s, we were together in the University of Delhi. Uh, and uh, then he moved to CSDS uh, in 2001. That's around the time I also came to CSDS. Uh, uh, and he was a faculty member here till 2008. From there, uh, he moved to uh, Center for the Study of Social Systems, School of Social Sciences, JNU, New Delhi, where he has been teaching since 2008. His major research interests are in the areas of identity politics, social and uh, political psychology, gender and sexuality, cinema and culture studies, and politics of knowledge. Besides professional academic writing, uh, he has also contributed regularly uh, to uh, uh, the print media. Uh, he's been an outspoken public intellectual uh, is also involved with various socio-political socio issues, and he's one of the key figures behind the People's Campaign for Resurgent Manipur, PCRM, uh, which is an initiative of citizens seeking to create a healthy public sphere and accountability of public offices and institutions in the state of Manipur. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Kajam, uh, is also a cinema and theater enthusiast. He has served as jury members in film festivals organized by the state and film fraternity. He has scripted and directed films, several films, Langoi uh, Chalabi, Paradise Under Siege 2004, which is a documentary film, and also Kari Gi Ki Ru Ni, Nung Si Ra Di, uh, Why uh, Be Afraid If You Love 2014. I'm sure I've got the original pronunciation wrong. Uh, it's a feature film and uh, also another film called Festivity Life Story 2019, which is a short fi fiction. Besides cinema, uh, uh, Bimal has also been the founder director of uh, Introspective Theatre and he has written and directed a play Azadi Ki Khamoshia, Silences of Freedom, a play based on Manto's work. That's another convergence between us. We both have liked and loved Mantu. Uh, and this was presented, this play at NSD in 2002. So without much uh, ado, and with thanks to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pridarshini Vijayashri, I would like to in invite uh, Dr. Bimal Akwajam for this lecture, very interesting, uh, interestingly titled, Unpacking the Script of the Archipelago as Manipur. Of, on history, memory, and nationalist subjectivities. So over to you, Bimal. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Ravi. I wish I was desperately hoping that I could make it to the center. I know it's, uh, it's been a long time that I haven't seen, and I have no qualm in admitting that um, uh, my nearly uh, association of a decade, uh, I mean, I started involving with the research project on the SISTA on the reconstructing life and partition studies. Um, before I actually uh, left the UN and joined CSTS. So that was one of the most enriching experience in my life so far. Uh, the, 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 the lunch time when we chat, the seminars and lectures, leading scholars from across the globe. Those are the days which I think I will never forget. And the basic foundations of who I am today has a lot to do with those experiences uh, during my stay in CSTS. And uh, in fact, this is uh, uh, important for me to also note that this is the first time that I'm talking uh, uh, in, a, in a program of the center after I left in 2008. It's been a long time. Uh, some of the issues that I'm going to share today um, uh, have been formulated while I was there in CSA, some of the basic publications were also done. I'm only expanding those things as deepened my understanding on some of those issues. And this is what I'm going to present today and share with all of you here. Uh, the, the, the one which I think uh, Ravi read out was an earlier abstract that I sent. The issue remains the same, but I think the Praveen had asked me to shorten the title a little bit. Uh, so I have titled the, uh, in the flyer, the, the, the title is, Archipelagic memory, unpacking a nationalist script. It remain, the content remains more or less the same. Uh, what I shall try to do is that it's very uh, unfamiliar. I'm keeping, a, like in the television studio, I'm keeping uh, my monitor in front of me and I'll try to read and I have the papers on my side. So what I'll try to do is that I'll read out and in between I might also speak uh, and explain a little bit as far as possible, I try to do that. So the title of the paper, as I've said, is the Archipelagic Memory, Unpacking a Nationalist Script. <clears throat> the place was under the spell of the stillness of the night of the appointed day in the month of August, 1947. As the clock was about to strike the midnight hour, Mr. G.P. Stewart got up from the chair and said, Your Highness, the British Paramountcy over Manipur state lapsed from this moment. The state of Manipur is handed over to your highness, unquote. These words momentarily broke the silence in the room in the British residency in Imphal, just as Pandit Nehru's Tris with Destiny speech reverberated around the same time in the Constituent Assembly far away in Delhi. And in an act that would mark the end of the imperial denouement, the British officer extended his hand to Maharaj Bodhachandra, who was then standing opposite to him. The monarch held out his hand and uh, held, the hand of the, held the hand of the British official who was in charge of the office of the political agent of the imperial British in Manipur. Both shook hands and then sat down. Unlike the pompous gathering in Delhi, which marked the transfer of power, it was rather an uneventful enactment that signaled the end of British sovereignty of the state of Manipur. Unlike the quietness of that night in August 1947, the British residency in Imphal was brewing with excitement and activities on 23rd March, 1891. On that day, in an act to assert his paramount power using the residency as its nerve center, the troops of the colonial British India launched an assault on the palace in Kangla Fort in the heart of Imphal. Troops of the then kingdom retaliated by bombarding the residency with cannon fires and rifles, and thus began the anglo manipuri War of 1891. It was a confrontation of two unequal powers, and as expected of such conflict, it ended with the defeat of Manipur in the hands of the colonial power. This war, in which the British had invested enormous amount of resources, men and material, 
rocked the British Parliament for weeks. For the Manipuris, besides the memories and historical narratives, it has given birth to literary works and cultural practices. These aspects in turn have come to constitute a dominant nationalist subjectivity that drives the people in the state. Indeed, we shall all die, but we shall not retreat. These words of Pauna Brazabasi, a military commander who died fighting the invading, uh, invading British in a decisive battle at Kongzhom continue to inspire generation till date. Today, many memorials associated with the war of 1891 dot the landscape of the state, inscribing the memories of exemplary acts of patriotism and sacrifices. The largest among those memorial stands at Kongzhom some 30 kilometers away from the state capital, instituted in memory of those who fought in that decisive war, which can be called Manipur's Battle of Thermopylae. And right at the heart of the capital city itself, there is also a landmark memorial at the spot where the victorious colonial power had publicly hanged Yubra Stikendrajit, along with General Thangal of the Manipur army on 13 August 19, uh, 1891. In recent times, many efforts have also been made to trace and memorialize many other heroes associated with that war, including the then Maharaja and some of his brothers and officials who were sent off to the Andamans by the victorious British after the war. In all likelihood, not many from those, of, uh, those from outside the state of Manipur would know anything about this war of 1891. This is due to two interrelated reasons. At one level, Manipur and much of India's Northeast is excluded from the realm of history, including uh, Indian history. At another level, it is likely to be seen as a regional history rather than a national history. I shall come to this exclusion a little later in the lecture. Over and above this exclusion, there is also an issue rooted in politics. As I have noted earlier, memories of this war is constitutive part of nationalist subjectivity in the state, which has witnessed protracted armed confrontation, confrontations between the Indian state and various armed groups. This being the case, a recent announcement by the government of India with reference to the war of 1891 invites our attention. As the Indian Republic marks the 75th year of its independence, the government of India announces its decision to rename Mount Harriet in the Andamans, which is the third highest peak in the island, as Mount Manipur in order, uh, in order to honor what it calls the freedom fighters from the erstwhile kingdom of Manipur that lies in the cups between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Speaking at a public function during his visit to the archipelago, the Andamans and the Nicobar Islands, the Union Home Minister, Mr. Amit Sah, announced the above decisions to rename Mount Harriet as Mount Manipur. He said, Manipur, and here I quote, Manipur never gave up and the people there continue to fight. Manipur was the only state that had implemented its own constitution. Though Manipur was under British occupation for a long time, the freedom fighters of Manipur always fought the British tooth and nail in battles. Manipuri war hero Yubras Tikendrajit and Thangal general were publicly hanged at Fida, which is uh, wrongly written in the pronounced and when he spoke, this Fida in Imphal. The British thought that by hanging them, they had crushed the freedom movement, he continues, but it did not happen. After the Maharaj Kulachandra Raja Singh and 22 freedom fighters were, were sent off to the Andamans, the decision, the contemporary decision is taken to honor these freedom fighters, he said. This decision to memorialize historical figures from Manipur is rooted in an effort to recraft history as a nationalist script to reinforce one, territoriality, and two, constitute nationalist subject, particularly to invoke an expression used by the Union Minister of External Affairs in the public lecture, unintegrated reason of the country. In the remaining part of this lecture, I shall 
make an attempt to unpack this script in the light of a complex theory in the past involving an interplay between memories and history with manifest political entanglements in one of the unintegrated areas of the post-colonial Indian state, namely the state of Manipur. Such an eng engagement, as we shall see shortly, reveals the nature of the nationalist subjectivities and their contesting narratives and memories and how Manipur as a native state becomes a part of India as much as how and when India becomes a part of Manipur. The script is also a political act that navigates to the nationalist subjectivities and their contesting narratives, memories on how Manipur uh, uh, as, as a state continues to occupy the Rashtra Chetna as it stands today. The first segment, what I, I'll divide this into two segments uh, and then address it, these specific aspects, how these memories and uh, uh, you know, history sort of uh, intersect and, and how the idea of India was conceptualized and imagined one can figure out through this. And as I said, how Manipur becomes a part of India or other way around, how India becomes part of Manipur. These are the issues that we will deal with here. This exercise has both epistemic and political dimensions. Past and the forgotten double of transfer of power for more than five decades, the state has been marked, the state of Manipur has been marked by protracted and multi-layer conflicts. At the center of these conflicts is the mobilization by armed groups based on what they call their right to self-determination and struggle for the restoration of lost sovereignty of Manipur. This claim is rooted in specific readings of the past, especially the one which has come to be known among the historian in this country as the integrations of the princely states. It is a well understood position that the war that we deploy defines and shapes the very nature of the phenomena that it signifies. In that, the expression integration only produces a certain picture of the phenomenon implicated in the emergence of the post colonial Indian state in the mid 20th century. Not only that, it may also be said that the choice of the word is a part of a politics or produces specific politics with its own evaluative dimensions and ethical ramifications. Consequently, expressions like integration and its opposite disintegration evoke different sense of the reality and our emotional response to the same differ. Thus, when the phenomenon is described as annexation as it is done in, 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 in Manipur by some section of the uh, people, rather than integration, it produces a very different sense of the reality in question. Needless to say, to call the phenomenon annexation is also founded on the politics which is implicated in the ongoing conflict. This is to say that the choice of the word integration has already presupposed a certain reality of what India is is articulated through history as a hegemonic narrative to create a, a kind of a selfhood of India. This history tells us a story of the transfer of power, which conjures up the pompous and yet poignant moment with the Trist with Destiny speech by Nehru in the Constituent Assembly. But this story has a forgotten double that exposes the politics of that subjectivity as well as well as the subjectivity that underlies the political unrest in the state of Manipur. That is the story of the lapse of paramount power over the native state, something that that uneventful exchange in the British residency between Mr. Stewart and Maharaj Bodhichandra in August represents. Thus it is in this sense that how we read past and seek to memorialize certain events in the past are deeply rooted in this political dimension of our discourses. It is this aspects which allows us to see the intimate connection between the ongoing protracted conflict in the state and the recent decision by the government of India to memorialize Mount Harriet as Mount Manipur. This decision is to, among others, positions the 1891 war as a part of the history of Indian national struggle against the colonial British. Simultaneously, it is also to reclaim and consolidate the territoriality of the post-colonial Indian state. 
that the decision was announced uh, at the Union territory of Andamans and Nicobar Island is significant. During the same visit to the archipelago, the Union Home Minister said that whenever he went to the Andamans or the India's Northeast, he got to hear this refrain that says Northeast and the mainland or the island and the mainland. Then he went on to cite the sacrifices and the sufferings of people, including Sarvaka, who were sent off to the Andamans uh, to be imprisoned in the cellular jail in the dreaded Kalapani for their involvement in the anti-colonial movement. That the place, the island, is painted by the sweat and the blood of the sons of the soil, or the rather sons of Bharat Mata, as the image has been involved in this space. It is in this context of territoriality that those Manipuris who had been exiled in the Andamans in 1891 were sought to be repositioned amongst the member of these nationalist pantheons. If anachronism is the greatest sin that a historian can commit, the move raises epistemic questions of historiography, such as were those Manipuris who fought the 1891 war conscious of themselves and their acts thereof as members or parts of the then emerging anti-colonial nationalist movement in South Asia? Or did those people who were part of the anti-colonial nationalist movement see those exiled in the Andamans from Manipur who are exiled in the Andamans as political prisoners of the colonial British? The answer to these questions simultaneously entail questions on the nature of the state and the political power prevailing in those days in South Asia and they extend in the composition of the anti-colonial movements. This is besides the epistemic questions. I do not intend to address these issues here in detail. However, it is instructive to note two things that have a bearing on these above questions. The first, as I have noted earlier, the history of the state, like those from the region, has been hitherto excluded from the writing and practice of history or historiography in this country. And there have been moves to include the same, the demands and the you know, discussion has been going on, how the Northeast history should be included in school textbook and so on. Which actually confirms the, uh, the fact that for 75 years, the history has been excluded from, from the Indian history. I'm, and I would argue that it's not only the Indian history from the realm of history, history as such. Second, the complementing this historical absence is the fact that there were instances in the past where the government of India sought to stop or discourage any move to memorialize events associated with the 1891 war itself. So what has changed? I'll just give an example that the, 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 the 13th of August is a state holiday in the state of Manipur, which is the day when, as I mentioned earlier, when the Tangal general and Yuvras were hanged in Imphal. It is a state holiday, it is practiced as I observe as a, a patriotic day. When the newly formed uh, or upgraded uh, state of uh, Manipur um, uh, in 1972, when the state government decided to observe this officially, uh, the then chief minister, uh, Muhammad Ali Muddin and his senior cabinet colleague, Yumnam Yaima, were about to attain that function, the inaugural state function of the 13th, and the SP of the state police came with a telegram from the Home Ministry pleading them or rather instructing them not to attend and not to encourage such kind of uh, you know, observation of Patriotic Day, uh, feeling that it will sort of fuel the uh, separatist movement uh, and so on. Uh, as Yum Nam Yaima wrote in his memoir, uh, they decided to go nonetheless and that's how uh, the function continues even today as a state holiday. So there was an effort to silence this part of the history. As I've said, it, it was part of the uh, national subjectivity that drives the people in the state, which is implicated in the armed conflict, uh, which is going on there. And understandably, uh, the state, Indian state, was apprehensive about uh, memorializing these events associated with 1891 war. But now the Indian state is trying to memorialize, but with a different dimensions to that, as I have mentioned. 
The question that we need to ask is two issues here. It is not merely to uh, discourage uh, because there has been this within court separatist movement or the political unrest and it might fuel that uh, sensibility if you observe that war memorial and so on. There's a deeper issues involved which reveals the nature of historiography as well as uh, the nature of the Indian state, how Indian state or Indian nation state is imagined. Sanjay Shubramaniam, noted historian Sanjay Shubramaniam says that civilization is the key matrix of writing history. When the Indians, Indians were seen as part of the people without history, Bankim Chattopadhyaya asserted that we must have a history. So to have a history is part of the nationalist movement. In fact, as Sudip Dukavir has points out, this nationalist movement and the history, the intimacy between the two, that you write that history, uh, writing that history is part of the nationalist movement. Uh, in the same sense, uh, you know, how the Indian nation is imagined is implicated in that history writing and the idea of civilization is implicated in, in, as a key matrix of writing history. For example, the, in, in counter to this idea of a historyless people, and when nationalists in Bengal, for example, as I said, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay says that we must have a history, this invisible aspect of the Indian as a historyless people was sought to be recovered to the idea of the Indic civilizations. In fact, in Nehru's discovery of India, he quotes Indologist Professor Childs talking about this 5,000 years old civilization. So the civilization is that idea which makes the uh, concept of or, or India as a tangible entity. And this, what might, one might call a civilizational cultural idea of India, later on mobilizes a political project of acquiring statehood. That was, uh, that was what we call it nationalist movement in the, in the 19th and 20th century. In the light of these conceptions, Indic civilization as something that uh, provides tangible uh, visibility to the idea of India, which later on acquires a political dimension in the struggle to acquire a state of its own, there is another aspect of history, especially vis-a-vis -vis with Southeast Asia that uh, Sanjay Shubramaniam notes, and that is regressive history. And this style of writing history, regressive history, happens with places where you assume the place to be a tabula rasa, where it doesn't have a civilization of its own. All that it carries is the imprints of the visiting civilizations. The Southeast Asia is often tend to be seen in that uh, the lens. And writing history vis-a-vis -vis with those places follows, as Anisha Ramanian points out, regressive historiography, which means you start from the present and you move backward and you, the history writing ends where you encounter the tabula rasa. I brought in this idea in order to reflect on the absence of the history of the Northeast in Indian history as such. To enter to this issue, there is a popular saying, one popularized by a union minister then, uh, which says as follows, Southeast Asia starts from India's Northeast. Southeast Asia starts from or begins from India's Northeast. This idea challenges some of those assessment which says that the categories like South Asia and South Asia are mere geographical uh, expressions this is as Sugata Vost, but uh, they are not merely geographical, geographical expressions. They are imbued with civilizational connotations. That is what Sunday Shubramaniam's comment uh, enable us to see that whatever is South Asia is because of the visiting civilization like the Indic civilization, the Cynic civilization, the Arab civilizations and the Western civilization and so on. And notice 
is often visualized as a part of the Southeast Asia. That's what the, this policy of look, uh, look is or act is policy was, uh, you know, popularized this idea that you must start this connectivity, India must connectivity with the Southeast Asia and the Northeast is the gateway. In that context, this statement comes up saying that the Southeast Asia or India begins from India's Northeast. This tells us that the Northeast is seen in a racial slash civilization cultural sense, a part of the Southeast Asia, but politically it is part of South Asia. So that the civilizational conception of the Northeast is inherently seen in the way Western scholars would see Southeast Asia as a tabula rasa and whatever it is, whatever it becomes visible is because of the imprints of the visiting civilization. A classic case of Manipur, Ras Lila, Sankritana and so on, they are visible precisely because it is seen as the imprints of the Indic civilization and otherwise a tabula rasa, a part of Southeast Asia. So therefore, when you visualize Northeast as a cultural civilizational entity, which is similar to the Indic, but not an inherent part of it, but something that carries its imprints. And that drives the exclusion or the other othering of the Northeast from the discursive as well as actual political practices. And I have written this incidentally during my days in, in CSDS, I flagged off this othering process, uh, you know, and how it is sought to be governed. Uh, for example, Armed Forces Special Power Act stands for a state of exception, which is used as a paradigm to govern the other, uh, which somehow could not be integrated into the political system, a formulation that I derived from uh, Giorgio Agamben's work uh, with reference to uh, uh, the experience of the Zoos in Germany, that this state of exception uh, was used as a paradigm to govern. So uh, I have articulated these issues, how these othering process happens because of the, uh, the civilizational conception of the region as a tabula rasa, uh, but something that carries the imprints of the visiting civilizations like the Indic and so on, and hence it becomes visible. Uh, so it is not part of it. Uh, in, in a, it's not a proper historical subject. Interestingly, I have also noted that there is a critical uh, aspects of the link which I have articulated in that article, which was published while I was in CSS in 2006. Uh, that there is an historical absence of the Northeast, a sort of compensated by an anthropological presence. Uh, you know, much of the academic works on the Northeast, you will see this in sociology and anthropology. And there are peculiar vocabularies which are more prominently deployed uh, such as ethnic, ethnic conflict. Uh, these words are absent when you're dealing with the so-called mainstream India. There you call it communal conflict and communalism and so on. But the term ethnic, how it has become uh, a substitute word for the rest without losing some of the essence that the uh, problematic concept uh, like race has. So it is used in ethnic conflict, ethnic identities, and so on. So from the choices of the vocabularies, the lenses through which uh, we see the Northeast, there is a particular marking out, a uh, particular way in which uh, the Northeast has been marked as the other, which is not essentially part or inherent part of the Indic civilizations, even though places like Assam and Manipur carries those imprints and so on, and particularly in Manipur. So that is the sort of a narrative. So one can make sense of this invisibility of the 1891 war and the absence of the Northeast from the uh, history textbook in this country for the last 75 years. And the debate has been going on now that people are talking about uh, the need to include them and so on. That absence from the history is driven by a particular way of imagining nation called India and its corresponding idea of how uh, the Northeast is imagined as the other within that. Uh, and, and hence its absence. And how uh, typically like the uh, Southeast Asia was, uh, was an anthropological subject to the Europeans initially before it acquires uh, the status of being a historical subject, there's a critical link between history and anthropology is an interesting aspects that one can reflect in this regard. Uh, 
I just wanted to read out uh, excerpt from that article that I wrote while I was in CSS in 2006, uh, which is the paradox of invisibility of history and visibility of anthropology of the reason is not a strange phenomenon. The process of producing historical truth is not free from the human intervention in the production of historical narrative for specific consumptions or for that matter in the selection of the facts that constitute historical archives or the use of the archival material for the production of historical narrative. Similarly, it has also been argued that anthropological objects are not simply given in advance of the anthropological projects, but are constructed in the conceptual ideological domains that themselves have histories, very often colonial history. In this sense, as far as South Asia is concerned, there is a distinctive unity between modern historiography and anthropology, as both have the moorings in colonial modernity. Does the historiographical invisibility and the anthropological visibility of the India's Northeast are reciprocal facets of the discursive unity of these two enterprises in South Asia? So that is exactly what I was saying at the beginning that there are epistemic concern here, issues involved uh, when you try to, and uh, how these particular way of writing history uh, uh, implicates inherently uh, or rather reveals how uh, you know, the India is imagined and how in that place North is appeared uh, in what form uh, initially uh, as a tabula rasa that which carries only then it can come. And this will account for the absence of that uh, history from the uh, general uh, history of India as it is taught in schools and colleges. Incidentally, I was told that even in the Indian History Congress for a long time, the history from the Northeast was included in a section and histories other than India, and it was clubbed together with others. So this exclusion of a historiographical exclusion is also marking the other, must be understood visibly with the theory uh, of the self as a story. There is a school of thought, both, which is available in psychology and anthropology as well, that our sense our self is nothing but a story that we tell in order to make ourselves intelligible. So it is a narrative, self as a narrative. In a very similar fashion, uh, history is a narrative that produces or renders the nation intelligible. And, and hence, uh, history becomes a, 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 a site of contestations of different nationalist projects. Uh, in today, you say the left wing and the right wing contesting on uh, how Indian history must be written and so on so on, so forth. It is precisely because this history writing is, uh, or history is part of narrating the selfhood of the Indian nation. So history can be seen as a narrative that produces the Indian nation and in that role, how that exclusion takes place. This exclusion of the North East plays behind uh, as to why this 1891 war uh, was sort of seen uh, was uh, was invisible to the narrative. And even when I'm presenting this paper, what, what one likely sense among the uh, that dominant ideological frame is that I am presenting something of a regional histories or areas, uh, area studies, a domain of area studies, not the universes. Though we might be quite conscious of the uh, fact that many of these epistemic enterprises are uh, driven by universalism of, of, of the West, uh, you know, uh, um, Dipesh Chakravarti's famous and provocative uh, phrase of provincializing Europe. And we might have argued that there is also a certain kind of universalism uh, within South Asia, which inherently produces the Northeast as a province. This uh, exclusion uh, was sought to be included by uh, a particular process. It is in this context uh, I've written uh, again, another work which published in the Sarai publications uh, while I was there, I think it was 2005, um, on AFSPA. Uh, I was discussing Armed Forces Special Power Act, uh, not only as a law uh, uh, given by the state, but as a political paradigm uh, of, 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 of deployment of how to integrate, how to incorporate uh, the excluded Northeast. It excluded the Northeast. As an exception, just as Agamemnon talks about uh, the state of exception as a paradigm to govern the other, who somehow could not be integrated into the political system. So the AFSPA smacks of that state of exception, which governs 
uh, the excluded in order to include them, which I call it inclusion by exclusion, that the Northeast is precisely included through this act of exclusion. So you can call it inclusion by exclusion. In contrast to the issue of the Dalits, which I call it exclusion by inclusion. They're excluded precisely because they are included. In them. And this inclusion is what uh, Ambedkar and others have tried to negotiate by trying to choose a different religion and to move out of the Hindu fall and so on. So in the case of Dalit, unlike the Northeast, in the case of the Northeast, it is inclusion by exclusion. So Abspa is a classic example. By excluding, you include them. Uh, in, in the Dalit case, it is the exclusion uh, by inclusion. So these are two different framework, uh, which was I formulated when I was working in, in CSDS. Uh, this is uh, the, the way in which uh, why the uh, 1891 war uh, uh, will not be part of the general narrative of Indian history, how this has been excluded. And I've also talked about how Northeast as the other by virtue of that, implicating, mind you, how India is imagined. And I know as Soren Kierkegaard often says, it is the exception which reveals the general more sharply uh, than the general could do itself. So you am I discussing this Northeast as an exception, another formulation which I, I could do it while I, I was there in CSDS. Uh, since then, uh, many have expanded uh, this, this idea. This exception reveals how the Indian nation is imagined. And, uh, and this particular uh, uh, narrative that I've just shared with you, the exclusion how 1891 war will not be remembered by or known by many people in this country is part of their exclusion. The fact that history of the Northeast has been excluded and so on implicates the way India is imagined. Now, the other part of uh, uh, this uh, is interestingly, as I, I have asked these questions about whether those people, not besides this exclusion, were seen as, as at as, as a part of the nationalist, uh, you know, uh, freedom fighters and so on uh, during their own time. There's an interesting uh, thing that these Manipuris, this Maharaja uh, Kuladha, Kuladhaza and, and, and his brother and some of those officials, 23 of them, who were housed in Mount Harriet uh, when they were exiled there. There's an interesting uh, incident during that one. Those people who, have been detained in Bengal for their anti-colonial struggle, participation in anti-colonial struggle, actually wrote to the British by saying that why we have been treated so badly uh, and we must be treated as political prisoners and you are giving such a nice facilities to these people, referring to those uh, Manipuris who were housed in Mount Harriet. Uh, they are not political prisoners. We are political prisoners. So the status of being a political subject, even then when they were housed in Mount Harriet, uh, uh, it was interesting to, to see that some of the nationalists uh, of those days from Bengal uh, consider themselves as political prisoners, but not uh, those Maharajas. Today, it is the same people in all in, in that, that this government is trying to honor them as freedom fighters as part of the general uh, history of Indian nationalist struggle. Next segment, which I would like to talk about it is that what other implication does this have? One of the things that we know that it was excluded before, now that it is sought to be incorporated, as I have mentioned at the beginning of my paper, this, this uh, act to memorialize is to create nationalism and, and also to assert the territoriality. Uh, what is interesting about the territoriality is when uh, Mr. Amit Shah announced, announced this uh, renaming uh, in his uh, recent visit to the Andamans and Nicobar Island, he said something very, very interesting. He said that whenever I go to uh, the Northeast or, or, or the Andamans, I get to hear this refrain saying that Northeast and the mainland island and the mainland. This is what he said in one of his speech, uh, speeches in the Andamans. Then he went on to narrate the sufferings of those uh, people who have been jailed in cellular, notorious cellular jail, and, and, and you know the blood and the sweat of those freedom fighters have met that island, the mainland. It's a very interesting 
uh, you know, assertion of territoriality or uh, sort of uh, uh, re-scripting that space as part of the mainland, precisely because of the blood and the sweat. And he also invoked the fact that Netaji Shivaj in the post, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, hoisted the flag, uh, this INA hoisted the flag, national flag there for the first time. Uh, interestingly, again, this remark that he mentioned uh, uh, led me to think about there is also another part where this uh, INA story gets implicated in Manipur, uh, that uh, there is a place called Moirang where this flag, tricolor was hoisted. They said for the first time in the mainland India. Now the Amit Shah has already claimed that the uh, you know uh, Andaman and Nicobar Island is the mainland. So therefore those Manipuris and uh, those uh, nationalists who's trying to sort of appropriate whichever word term that you might use is or re-render uh, Manipur as part of the nationalist history is to claim that it was in Manipur for the first time that the tricolor was hoisted in the mainland India. Uh, by noting that there was already a, a earlier uh, uh, act of hoisting flag in Andaman and Nicobar Island, and Andaman is not part of the mainland, and Manipur is the mainland sort of thing. Now the peripherality of the uh, state of Manipur, uh, not only in geographical sense, but also in the national consciousness or Rashtra Chetna, is now sought to be repositioned as part of the core Rashtra Chetna. One might say that this new transformation has something to do with the assertion of the Hindu right nationalist project and the, the, the community, especially those in the valley of Manipur, are Manipuri Vaishnavites, a uh, majority of them are Manipuri Vaishnavite. And therefore, it is a, a way to walk through that dynamics to create. And also the fact that many of the within court, uh, the tribals of that state were involved in the struggle in INA and they have been flagging off another figure from Manipur called Rani Gajini uh, as another figure and so on. So this has been an effort in the recent times to relocate, to reposition uh, the experiences and histories of that place as part of the overall Indian historical um, you know, enterprise. And that recent announcement of renaming is part of the same discursive practice. Now, I would address, as I try to wind up this uh, presentations, uh, it just starts on my second segment, which I term, I call as discovery of Mother Manipur. You know, I, when we look at this transfer of power, we don't remember that it, as I have noted in the earlier part of my presentation, that this particular uh, uh, transfer of power that we remember with Nehru's speech, was happening in the same night, in the same uh, time, following the Indian Independence Act, uh, you know, that uh, whereby it says that uh, one consequence of uh, creating the dominion is the lapse of paramount power over the uh, native stage. And that transfer of power, which was enacted, and I was quoting that from a memoir uh, uh, of, of the ADC to the Maharaja, uh, it is from his memoir that I've quoted those remarks and those uh, that incident that he narrated in his work. Uh, for them, what is interesting is how do uh, uh, Manipuris see this crucial moment of the connections between uh, the, the Indian nation and, and, and the Manipur as a separate, and here is the conjunction end that I'm using, India and Manipur sort of, a, uh, you know, aspects that we are dealing with here. This exclusion that I have just shared became the background in which this 20th century second generation Manipur discovered their mother Manipur. And here I quote from another memoir uh, by uh, a well-known singer who's called the Melody King of Manipur. Uh, he wrote in his diary and he, you know, he, he, he was uh, studying uh, a Hindustani vocal in, in Lucknow in Bhat Kandi Institute. Uh, and, and he wrote this in his memoir, and I'm reading it out first in Manipuri. Uh, this is a very powerful quotation and very insightful one. Uh, and let me quote this. Mapanda Lairaba Matamda Manipur Imagi Asingba Masad Ado Kangla E. Mapangi Mina Aikoibu Masad Kangidaba. 
Manipur Kadai the Lay High Bapawa Kambidava, I koibu Yam Nahantana Lova Umnamak Ase Kangle E. Unquote. But in English translation, rough translation is we begin to know the real identity of Mother Manipur after we have been staying outside the state. That the outsiders, these people from the so called mainstreams, do not know us, our identity, and that they do not even know where Manipur is, and their contemptuous outlook towards us, all these we came to know. Unquote. <clears throat> it is this sense or being to use a term popularized by Charles Taylor, misrecognition or myth being misrecognized, that sense of invisible and humiliation played a crucial role in reading past as a history. So this generation will read history in a peculiar uh, sense and I will share very briefly how it contrasted with the, the first generation, the earlier generations uh, who were involved in the, uh, when the, uh, you know, transfer of power moment. The self-discovery in the second half of the 20th century is not quite a matter of the past. It still lingers on among the contemporary generation as well, especially those who come out in search of education and jobs. This sense of self has critical, uh, critical bearing on the way uh, one reads the issue of when and how Manipur becomes a part of India. Uh, incidentally, this is a question that I left behind in, in uh, uh, you know, this is a personal note uh, in a memorial lecture that, in an inaugural memorial lecture that I delivered in 2006 in Imphal. It was in the name, uh, that, that memorial lecture was instituted in the name of Arambam Shomarendro, who is a very well-known and influential writer. And incidentally, he was the founding general secretary of the largest, uh, one of the biggest underground political armed groups called United National Liberation Front. And the singer that I've quoted, he was the first chief of army of that organization. After they uh, uh, you know, uh, were given, or he was rather given amnesty by the government of India, he joined uh, the All India Radio and became, uh, he was truly uh, uh, the, the biggest singer of modern Manipur. He was uh, uh, you know, part of that UNLF and, and the Somarindro, uh, whose inaugural memorial lecture I deliver, uh, was the founding general secretary. Incidentally, in, in his memoir, Aigi Dairidagi, Bahari wrote about how they have discovered Manipur. They share their experiences. Uh, Somarendra was studying uh, defense studies in Pune University then to the late 1950s and early uh, 60s. That's the period uh, that, that Bahari was studying uh, music in, in Bhat Khan Institute. Just imagine two young people in their early 20s with that sense of suddenly realizing that people don't know where Manipur is and that people look down upon that and that India, they, they win. And this was repeated by uh, one of the leading uh, uh, member of the uh, armed group as saying that the India that we knew in, when we were child, we discovered that that's not the India. And that is the discovery through which they discover Mother Manipur. And that's the beginning in some sense of the uh, armed conflict uh, yeah, in, in, in the state. This discovery, uh, you know, uh, is, as I said, it still continues uh, in contemporary. A lot of youngsters will complain that people don't know where Manipur is. They will be mistaken for a Chinese and it continues 75 years after independence. So their father's generation's discovery uh, that we, we have been looked down upon and people don't know why Manipur is, is absent, is, in, is invisible. And this sense of invisibility, if you think about it, that's the same sense of invisibility that the nationalists in Bengal felt or in, in South Asia felt, or the humiliating experience of being thrown out from the train uh, that uh, Gandhi, uh, MK Gandhi went through. A similar kind of thing was repeated now, in, incidentally, this is what I have articulated elsewhere as a moment uh, which also reaffirms what often uh, has been noted by many post-colonial scholars like Patu Chatterjee, Rashis Nandi, who says there is a continuity between the colonial and the post-colonial. So this discovery re-enters the relationship between uh, India and Manipur, and I will end by looking at how their re-reading of that past 
and their generation earlier to them, what is the relationship between the two? And what this declaration by the government of India has to do with that discovery? And, and I'll end with that. Even though I have left, uh, left this question in that memorial lecture, uh, at the end of that memorial lecture, as when did uh, Manipur uh, become a part of India, I would rather enter it the other way around now for this presentation. I would rather ask, when did India becomes part of Manipur? And I do this for two reasons. One is to locate the essence of the narrative from, uh, 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 from this, uh, you know, uh, from the state of Manipur itself or from the periphery as the center, if you want, if you need to call it. So uh, you know, I would turn the periphery into a center and then try to write it. And hence the question is, uh, you know, when did India become a part of Manipur? That way I will position it. Second reason is that there has been too many uh, and uh, repeatedly, uh, you know, uh, pronounced truths about uh, at the events uh, around the transfer of power, which requires to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, unsettled a little bit and to unpack some of those assessments, particularly very popular narratives in Manipur. And that's the second reason why I have chosen to frame this question as when did India become a part of Manipur? Now, if you ask this, one of the most popular is a statement is. 15 October 1949. 15 October 1949 is as in Manipuri word, they say that you will often hear this word called uh, India ki in the Yaukiba, that is Manipur uh, coming under the fold of India, is 15 October 1949. For those uh, of you who are unfamiliar with this, this is the day when the controversial merger agreement, which was extracted from the Maharaja under duress, he was actually uh, detained uh, in Shillong and not allowed to go back to Manipur until he signed that agreement uh, uh, in, in Shillong uh, from 17 September to 21st September 1949. This merger agreement was extracted from the Maharaja. And he pleaded, and another fact which many people may not know, Manipur is the only state in the entire South Asia and perhaps even in Southeast Asia, which had an assembly or constituted through an election based on universal adult franchise under the constitution of Manipur. Uh, which incidentally, uh, uh, Amit Shah mentioned that Manipur had a constitution of its own and so on, as he has already, I've already quoted him. And under that constitution, an election was held in, in, in 1948 um, to constitute this assembly, which was inaugurated on 18 October 1948. And, and uh, there was an assembly and the Maharaja keep on pleading, that is, I'm not going to add, this is uh, uh, it's a long uh, exchange of letters uh, between the representatives of the Dominion government of India and the Maharaja. The Maharaja says, let me go back home in fall, I'll consult with my council of ministers. I am no longer the sovereign king. I am only a constitutional monarch. I have an assembly and duly elected assembly. And there is a government, uh, elected government, let me consult. But the government, uh, the dominant government of India representative insisted that they will not recognize those things. They will only deal with this and so on. So they, they, that agreement was extracted on 21st September 1949 in Shillong. And that agreement was implemented on 15 October. It is the day or when that state assembly was unceremoniously dissolved and the government was also uh, so dismissed uh, by the government of India on 15 October, which is the implementation of the, uh, the, the controversial Nazar agreement. This event is part, these series of events have been part of what we will consider as I have noted earlier, integration of the native states or the princely states. This particular moment in Visavi with Manipur was being termed by a public convention held in Imphal in the 90s as annexations. And many of these people will use the word annexation of Manipur in 49. I have highlighted uh, 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 one interesting part of this is uh, in that article that I mentioned uh, published in Sarai in 2005, uh, that the uh, VP Menon's choice of the term is not integration. 
with reference to Manipur, he said it is takeover. We decided to take over Manipur. The region he gave was a strategic and underdevelopment of the regions. It's very interesting that unlike Kashmir and Hyderabad, the Maharaja of Manipur had already signed the instrument of vexation on 11 August 1947, well before the midnight of August, where the transfer of power takes place. And under that instrument of fixation, particularly in section seven and eight, the sovereignty of the Maharaja in and around his territory remains intact. And he was not obliged to accept any future constitutions by virtue of this agreement. If any constitution, that would, that would mean uh, that the Indian constitution which was adopted elsewhere. That's a legal point of view. So he was, he has already signed under his sovereign power, he has constituted a constitution. It started before that, before he signed the instrument of fixation. The process was already started and there was a drafting committee of a constitutions uh, and then the election was held under that. Then the assembly was inaugurated on 18 October, 1948. And, and that government was dismissed unceremoniously following that controversy, controversial March agreement and as I said, it is interesting that VP Menon, the, the, the Secretary of State, uses the term takeover. This I have highlighted in, in, in that work, uh, was published in CSDS. The choice of the word was takeover, uh, uh, not integration. Now that uh, in the 90s, many of these people who were in their public conventions, incidentally attended by even people, very prominent citizens of the state, uh, some of whom even went on to become uh, you know, uh, leading leaders of the Bharatiya Janata Party uh, uh, also were involved in that declaration, which term that event as annexation. Uh, in, in fact, some of the younger scholars, uh, uh, is, uh, a scholar of, uh, there's a young scholar of uh, jurisprudence, he even term it as not annexation, but occupations. So these are the different ways of looking at that moment, how that kingdom uh, became a sort of uh, was dismissed, the kingship was removed, and so on. This argument that the uh, India, uh, Manipur, uh, become part of India on 5th of October is deeply problematic. And that's why I was turning around this question by asking when did India become part of Manipur, ra rather than asking when did India become part, Manipur become part of India. I'll just explain this in two specific examples, then I will wind up. Very short examples, I will go, we will not go into detail. To ask when did India becomes a part of Manipur, this, this explanation of the merger as a turning point is problematic uh, interpretation has been noted by, uh, you know, including the ADC to the Maharaja who wrote uh, uh, this well-known memoir called Shalom 1949, because there was already uh, the instrument of vexations by that, Manipur was already uh, uh, sort of surrendered into the dominion and exited to the dominion of India. There are other scholars such as a leading public intellectual, he is no more. One of those uh, scholars which becomes uh, uh, a savior for uh, scholars. Uh, we were, when I was a young scholar, his works become a savior uh, in the sense that there was very few literatures available and he was a very passionate guy. He compiled a lot of books. Uh, this professor, Sanazawa, uh, you know, uh, he would argue uh, on a legal point of most of his, much of his take is from the point of view of jurisprudence. Uh, and he would articulate um, the problematics of these merger agreements and he will consider the uh, instrument of accession as a treaty. Uh, there are reasons for looking at that. I'm not going to hear that. Uh, why it should and it can be read as a treaty relationship. But there are other aspects that, uh, according to the uh, Independence Act, there are beyond the jurisprudence, there are political facts, and beyond this uh, instrument accession being signed on 11 August 1949, there are other uh, development and political practices around that, uh, which complicates this interpretation of you know, October uh, 1949 is the day Manipur became under the fold of India. Uh, that really can be problematic with considering these things. So let's go back and ask the way the idea is India becomes a part of Manipur. And as I said, and then we uh, end with what does this memorialization mean? 
I will choose, like most authors would do, according to certain perspective and consideration, I'll choose a very crucial mo moment in the modern history of Manipur, the formation of uh, a Nikhil Manipur, a Hindu Manipuri Mahasava in 1930, 1934. It is, you know, the new emerging middle class and educated class, the Maharaj are led and they form uh, an association, uh, which is actually for the first time, a, a rudimentary, uh, you know, organ, uh, an institution coming uh, separate from the state that's germinating that process. So you might call it, it, it could be the first modern, uh, you know, uh, moment of uh, emergence of civil society. So Nikhil Manipuri Hindu Mahasabha, which was formed in 1930s and in 34 to be precise, in its inaugural uh, session, there was a song, and I quote a line from there, and then we can see what does that line mean. The line goes like this, and here I quote, Bharat ki mamom asami nuza ekwegi manu sibi bande manipur matram. The rough translation uh, is, goes something like, the daughter of Bharat, the nubile or the lady of Assam, our beloved mother, hail mother Manipur. That's the line which was sung in the inaugural sessions of that one. So Bharat ki Mamom, the daughter of Bharat, you know, and, and the Asami is a lady from Assam, our beloved mother. Uh, uh, can you change this battery is low? So that is that gives you a sense of a very different sense of, uh, uh, give me a battery charger that's going off. Uh, Ravi, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, now it's back. Uh, did did it's you back. hear what did you say? Yeah, I can see you now. Yeah. Okay, I was, did you hear that uh, line that I just quoted or should I repeat yeah, it again? Yeah. We, we heard you, we heard you. Okay, so it, it, this song was sung at uh, the emergence of this organization, which is the rudimentary or the first originary moment where the civil society emerges in modern Manipur. And this song was sung in 1930s, which says that the Manipur is described as a lady of Assam and daughter of Bharat, and, but it is mother Manipur. And this sense of awareness, which was there in the 30s, what does it mean for us to say then that when, when does India become part of Manipur? This is one moment that allows us to uh, think. And given this uh, uh, sense at the background, what happened is um, that uh, the, the way the first generations, particularly when we look at the memoir of uh, Sri Ananda Mohan, who was the ADC to the Maharaja, who was seen, who was also detained with the Maharaja in Shillong when the Madhya Agreement was signed, for him, in his text, uh, this is a fantastic, you know, one excellent uh, text to uh, uh, read and decipher, uh, you know, in the, in the historically very significant uh, text. But I'm not going into that detail, but in, in the larger paper that I have written on this. Uh, for them, I'll sum up by saying that they see as a loss of kingship rather than saying Manipur becoming part of India. Broadly, they are the, the tonal quality of uh, the, that memoir uh, registers uh, uh, is if there's an implicit acceptance of, 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 of Manipur as being a part of a larger whole. But that larger whole is not the nation state. That was the framework was the colonial state. And that is why they said Asami Nuja, which is the lady of Assam, because the chief commissioner of Assam was the nodal officer through which the king transacts after 1891 war. So Assam was the immediate context and the larger context is the colonial state. So I think for uh, having signed the instrument uh, accession, uh, for that generation, if I use Ananda Mohan, who was the ADC to the Maharaja, uh, that moment of Maja was seen in 1914, was seen more, more or less like a loss of kingship rather than Manipur becoming a part of India as the contemporary generations would see it. 
My suspicion is that this new way of reading as Manipur becoming part of, part of India, uh, uh, that Mazar as, as that moment, is read by those generations who had gone through this sense, who suddenly realized that implicit India, the nature of that implicit India, in the traumatic experience as represented by the quotation from Bahari, uh, or uh, that famous singer, uh, that, that humiliations, that invisibility, that the implicit India that his elder generation had seen revealed much more sharply the, the, uh, in, in, in that generation. And it is that experience and the memory of that experience is reading a particular moment in the past as a moment of when Manipur becomes a part of India. This uh, we can explain it in a large interesting way of how memory and history is related, not simply reading it as two binary concepts, uh, but rather uh, uh, one fits uh, uh, to one another, you know, a memory and a history can be seen. So for me, I think this reading of Manipur becoming a part of India uh, by the, through the act of Mazar in 1949 is the second generation who have discovered India uh, uh, and, and uh, encountered with an India through that experience of humiliation, they discovered the mother Manipur and that experience and the memory of that experience actually re-enters that past of 1949 to read it differently. And it is what drives what you call a separatist movement or a national liberation movement, something that has been going on, this armed conflict in the state of Manipur for the last five to six decades. It is this particular phenomena and the past that wittingly or unwittingly has been touched upon by the government of India's decisions to declare Mount Harriet as Mount Manipur. Under a new way of imagining India, under certain ideological uh, you know, theme, how far that encounter, that attainment to incorporate will be successful, how is it going to be seen, and what kind of uh, discovery of Manipur that has been done by the second generation, will there be any change in that, or will there be change in the way uh, India is being imagined so far, all of these things are an, a part of the unfolding events right in front of us. And these unfolding events are something that uh, this decision by the government of India uh, invite us to engage with. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bimal, uh, for a lucid uh, presentation. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I uh, kept thinking of, uh, yes, those uh, days uh, and your old piece in the Sarai Reader and also uh, the kind of discussions we used to have in the, in the 1990s, in uh, the late 80s and 90s in the university, if you uh, remember. Yeah. You know, uh, Professor Randhir Singh, right? His favorite joke, one of his favorite jokes uh, about uh, the Northeast was, uh, I go to the Northeast and students, uh, uh, they're asking me, we are not part of India, tell me. Huh? And I uh, ask them a, uh, you know, a question, do you have corruption in uh, the Northeast? And then they say, yes, we do have. Of course, then you are a part of India. Okay, you are integrated in India. So irony, you know, irony is a takeaway kind of sentiment in the presentation that you are trying to make. Uh, there is memory, there is history, and there is, uh, you know, a play between layers of memory, as it were. Hmm? And there are uh, wonderful invocations of uh, these artists and songs, these other histories, okay? We know from, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, we are already, you know, uh, uh, kind of 80 years, uh, 75 years old nation, as it were. And there are histories, new histories that have been written that have critiqued, critique and also with irony, uh, written about these other histories that have been written, uh, uh, challenging the mainstream nationalist narrative, right? So for example, Shahid Amin would say uh, uh, in one of his articles uh, that we had celebrations like Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav at different points of time 
and historians, local historians from Gorakhpur, for example, or from different regions from Uttar Pradesh, let's say, let's say Madhya Pradesh, huh? different regions, states, etc. And these little institutions there, they are writing their own histories uh, as a contribution to the development of the idea of India, right? So as if there is a havan, there is a yagya going which the, uh, you know, uh, these uh, people are participating. So he called it Yogdan perspective. Hmm? Quite clearly, the history of the Northeast is not so integrated, obviously integrated, that you can subsume it under Yogdan. Even though, even uh, the term Yogdan actually is dripping with irony. Hmm? You cannot assume that people just, you know, uh, 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 participating, participated in the uh, Yagya, just responding to the call automatically, as it were, to uh, the father of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. As you're saying, you know, things are evolving fast. There is a sense of deep uh, sense of exclusion where, where this uh, new, uh, uh, new, new description of Manipur and new way of looking at it by uh, the Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, right? It, it, is, it is a good occasion. I was also wondering about, you know, uh, uh, this is a good question, uh, the, the inversion that you are trying to uh, affect. When did India become part of Manipur? It's, 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 it's a wonderful inversion. I was thinking of, you know, various memoirs and travelogues and uh, uh, that have been written and stories, fiction and poetry uh, written uh, in Hindi about the Northeast in general and Manipur in particular. I was thinking of Anil Kumar Yadav's Yavi Koi Desh Hai Maharaj, which is very ironical, you know, invocation and description of, uh, of the Northeast. Lal, Bahad Lal Bahadur Verma, another historian, uh, uh, and Gopal Pradhan, they have all engaged with, uh, with because they spent uh, some time there and they engaged with the way uh, uh, Manipuris and North Easterns, uh, Easterners in general looked at uh, uh, looked at India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was also, you know, uh, thinking of the role of institutions because it, play in this uh, making part of each other. Uh, this process of two uh, two two territories becoming part of each other. So there is a soft thing going on, right? Around language, around the, uh, the, 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 the uh, territory that uh, uh, songs, for example, folk songs could travel uh, through the airwaves. And there the sovereign, you know, the sovereign uh, of one nation did not really work there. Hmm? So uh, broadcasts that were not, could not be meant for a particular territory. So what kind of tension uh, did this poet who sang on AIR, right, feel? And what was the sense of alienation? This poet uh, uh, had to, you know, join some other movement, right? And uh, part of the armed struggle, if I got to, uh, uh, and became part of the armed struggle, etc. cetera. So, so, so obviously there is a deep sense of dissatisfaction uh, with, the, with whatever the, that person is being able to do in the AIR uh, uh, headquarters or AIR uh, broadcasting studio, et cetera, et cetera. But that is where I will stop. And there are questions. I can see some questions in the uh, chat box. Uh, but if thing or you want me to uh, care? Can you read out? Uh, yeah, OK. So uh, Cliff says, uh, how did Manipuris react to the renaming of the mountain and to the Indian government rhetoric around stop, 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 stop. Puri elites versus Ma uh, Ravi, I couldn't hear. Can you follow me? They have different Can views. I will need to leave. I will need to leave. Acha, he's going. Uh, uh, but he has, you know, posed. I am not able to hear. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, 
Hello. Did you uh, did you get the question or not? I only get one, which asks about the reactions or response of the people to the declaration to rename. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Which means uh, okay. There was not much of a question. I will come back to my own question. But why okay. don't you respond to this one? Yeah. Yeah. The the, the what I said that I in fact that was one of the segment I left out, which is where you know the detail is going to be very long. That's why I cut short. In my paper, it is far more longer. Uh, in fact, I was um, evaluating two of the texts. One is the memoir by the ADC himself, who was involved in that merger agreement. And I was trying to read how, uh, as uh, how memory and, and history sort of uh, interact in that text, uh, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, so uh, that this part I call it the announcement and the celebration. That was one of the dimensions through which I was trying to uh, deal with this. So there, according to newspaper report, there was a huge celebration. It said, you know, the CM was happy. I, I get a feeling it is also. Uh, driven by uh, a need to be recognized, to be acknowledged as existing entities. So that, that, I think that is one way, but there is also another segment, especially mediated by uh, that discovery of Mother Manipur by the second generation, which I have narrated. There, there is this apprehension that this is nothing but an effort to, uh, you know, appropriate Manipur's history. Uh, you know, by the Indian state. It is part of their, so to speak, counter-insurgency mechanisms, you know. Uh, that's, that's one way of looking at it. So as far as the response of the, uh, the Manipuris are concerned, sweet, I'm just, wait, let me finish that. Yes. And the battery is going to go, that's why I was trying to recharge it. Anyway, so there are two, four responses. One is that some sections are happy and I can understand it as, uh, uh, in a moment when somebody recognizes you and, and you know you become a part of the civilized history sort of thing, you know you, you you become a historical subject, not an anthropological subject. And I, I get a feeling uh, that's the sense of being recognized. You know, otherwise people keep on complaining, saying that you know where are you from? Where is Manipur? Where is Nagaland? You have popular films on that. You know, uh, in even the Mericom would have in his biography saying that people didn't know where Manipur is and so on. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I had, uh, you know, it was my father's generation, the second generation who discovered. Incidentally, that gentleman was uh, a good friend of my father as well. Well, you know, on a personal note, my father took me to him to learn music, uh, you know, when I was in school. So uh, in my generation, I had my own shares of those experiences where Manipur is and people don't know kind of thing. Uh, so being recognized, I, I keep feeling some people might feel good, but going by the second generation discovery, uh, there is already that the kind of India that they sense. So there, there might be a question mark and apprehension. So there are two, both the uh, responses are found, uh, but um, more often than not in the media, you will find the celebrations more than the other uh, side of the stories. I, I, I couldn't get the other questions when you were asking, is there any other one can repeat it or question was specific how did people react to this uh, you know uh, renaming of the uh, renaming of the uh, mount uh, harriet uh, as mount manipur mm -hmm. you see that yeah yeah that i have already answered that's the general okay no the point that i was trying to make is obviously there is a hierarchy therefore right in the larger narrative that you are construct, uh, constructing there is a hierarchy between history and anthropology hmm? Mm -hmm. Because history is part of this, uh, you know, civilizational capital, as it were. Yeah, that's, that's true. So you are excluded by becoming, and therefore you become part of the uh, anthropology, and mm -hmm. not this uh, uh, this history which is exalted, which has a deeper root, which has a deeper chronology, which has deeper connections, as it were, cultural connections, uh, at, uh, and all those things. All that comes out very clearly. But thinking about the last 75 years, and that's where the power of Amit Shah's speech comes from, right? That not enough was done. And here I would like to, you know, uh, uh, you know, ask you a question, which may not be, you know, uh, your concern, but I'm interested. How have the historians since independence 
treated this question, right? Uh, uh, whether ha they have done justice. Secondly, if there was an AIR, All India Radio, right, in that area, how was it trying, you know, uh, playing its role uh, uh, or how was its role visualized in the tense uh, moments of uh, uh, post-independence, uh, you know, post-1947-48 period where, yes, you could celebrate the local culture, you could celebrate local uh, language, you could celebrate uh, traditions, but only till that far. Hmm? That is why the, the poet would feel, uh, that is my hunch, right? That's my speculation, would feel that not, it was not adequate, right? It still looks like annexation. It still looks like occupation, etc. I'm talking about these little institutions, institutions uh, of historians there and, histo uh, and people who are doing communication via All India Radio, because All India Radio was effective for very, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the terrain uh, that uh, uh, Manipur uh, represents. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, as I said it, uh, there was more or less a silence. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? <coughs> can you hear me, Ravi? Hello, am I audible? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. I, I was saying that there was a sort of a silence about this 1947-49 events. Uh, I mean, for a long time, in fact, it, that issue came off uh, majorly in the 1990s. So it was already murmuring awareness of that uh, appeared in the 70s, but it becomes a part of the larger public discourses only in the 1990s. So there was a very uncharacteristic silence about that 1949 event or the merger and the extraction of the agreement and so on. Uh, now, completely opposite to that is that, you know, this has been talked about much more openly. There are poetry, there are, you know, uh, you know songs, there are uh, plays, people reenacting it and so on. So in, in terms of uh, uh, the way people uh, remember that event uh, is no longer uh, silent, uh, and, and scholars have been trying to uh, address the issues, but as I was flagging off here, in terms of the way history is written and how memory and history sort of intersect, uh, a lot more uh, needs to be uh, done. They are still uh, unabashedly driven by uh, political projects. Uh, as a student of social sciences, you know, uh, I find some of these uh, uh, assessment problematic. That's why I was trying to rerun the encounter with uh, memories and histories and how, how certain facts get articulated and put forward. Uh, but in the public domain, uh, you, you, you do talk about these events now. Uh, and, and there are plays around this one, uh, you know, you know and right of this most more visible. But I told you there's a uh, almost like for 50, 60, 70, for 20, 25 years, there was a complete silence for a long time. Uh, anyway, uh, there's one question by Aditya Kiran Kakati. Uh, uh, you want to type your question, Aditya? Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, Bimal, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, could you please tell us more about any reactions or local contents in, mem in memory to the INA flag raising narrative in Moirang uh, versus Andamans? Uh, that is my assessment. Uh, Nobody is going to talk because I was only interpreting what Amit Shah said. That, you know, he often hear that Northeast 
uh, whenever you go to Northeast, he says that there's Menlin and the Northeast. And then he says, in the same breath, he spoke about island and the mainland. Then he went on to narrate that uh, Andaman is not an island, it is the mainland because it is soaked with the blood and tears of nationalist uh, struggles. No, it's a very specific question. It is no, no, that's what I'm saying here. That. So in that sense, he talked about the hoist, uh, hoisting of flag in Andamans, which preceded the one in Manipur. I was only pointing it out today that people might take note of it this later on that I'm pointing out that so far the narrative has been that for the first time on the men and Indian soil, the flag was hoisted in Moirang in Manipur. That's the narrative. Now, if you have called Andaman as the men, you know, it, 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 in, in a way, it, it subverts the earlier claim that uh, uh, hoisting of flag in Moirang is the first in the men, because they are, Andaman is the men now. You, you get what I was saying in my presentation. So that was my first uh, take on this idea of uh, reimagining the territory as the mainland, and 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 rather than outside of uh, the uh, the national mainstream sort of thing, uh, this memorialization is trying to co op that as a part of the mainland. Uh, so that's that's the kind of uh, contradiction that you might find it. Are there? Uh... Any more questions, Ayodhya? Can you see any questions? Okay, thanks, uh, Bimol. Uh, yeah, it's my uh, pleasure. Uh, okay, no, so uh, no, our audience thanks you. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks a lot uh, on behalf of everybody here. Thanks to Vijayashree, thanks to Ayodhya, and also to Praveen Kumar for setting this up. And thank you once again, Bimol, for. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, for this uh, lucid presentation, wonderful, and we'll continue this conversation offline. And if and when we meet, let's hope we meet. Yeah, I, 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 I'll try to visit once. I was asking the Shri about, uh, you know, some of my colleagues there. It's been a long time then, it's, and I, I should thank you and the Shri and others uh, that I'm so happy to to be back in center. I wish I was sitting in in that right. seminar and then have a cup of tea and I don't know whether you still have the basement cafe and uh, where we have long hours. We don't have the cafe but yeah the place is very much there. And okay. Office so, is great. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try to visit it uh, one of these days and it's, it's a pleasure talking to you uh, and sharing some of the works that I started there and which is uh, culminating and the things that have developed so far. And you know, like that, you flat off issues about how it was otherized and history exclusion. All these things I formulated while I was there, but the fact that it was integration, but the word was take over. <laughs>